Fridays with Fela, descendant, the son of Fela, Fela reborn, my main man, Shayon Kuti, African Airways. They're still doing that investigation on the Ethiopian and Indonesian crash uh, in Boeing has finally grounded all of those uh, flights. They're now finding out that the deaths of over 300 African and Asian people is uh, more so the result of greed, Western greed, so dead Africans, dead Asian people who are dead of, as a result of corporate white Western greed, uh, nothing new in history, but uh, African Airways. Um, good morning, this is Bro Diallo, Q4 Radio. I'm broadcasting on the Q4 website at q4.org, the TuneIn app, iTunes Radio, and of course, for my Chicago ones, people living in the belly of the beast, <coughs> excuse me, AM 1680. And you can also find me at the Bro Diallo uh, YouTube page. Subscribe, check in for notifications, and you will never miss a live broadcast of uh, the Bro Diallo Show. Too many ways to listen for y'all to be missing. So get with the program. Anyway, let's proceed. Um... Buju Banton released a statement said that he will no longer be performing uh, homophobic, infamous homophobic song. Ebony Magazine reported, Boom Bye Bye and Arabati Boy, Ed Rubai, not promote no Nasi Man, Mafi Dead, will no longer be performed. And, and you know, I love that song. Back in the day, way back, 92. I remember when they were playing it on the radio and somebody ran and told white man what the lyrics meant because white folks, they weren't too good with Patois. And you see here that all um, the time. Now, I wasn't too, again, I'm, a, I'm from the Midwest. And Batiman, Chichiman, all that stuff, I didn't really know what it meant. And I was listening to the song, you know, I was, think I was my first year at uh, Downstate, uh, State University of New York, Downstate. I think I was in the cafeteria. Boomba Uman is the greatest man. Driver put Bondilan Buju Lover from and down to foot bottom. So my man and turn around where they get that from. And this Trinidadian guy came to me and was like, yo, why are you singing that song? I'm like, it's a hot song. I don't even think I knew who Buju was. You know, this is as, and here's the thing about them making Buju denounce his song every few years. Buju had to step up and say, I'm sorry. Missouri, every few years, is that Buju, from the, the, the early, early 90s, made the conversion to Rastafari. And if you listen to albums like Till Shiloh, Strangest Feeling I'm Feeling, Oh, Jah Love, We Will Always Be Leaving. Remember that? He made a conversion to Rastafari, and he started doing what they call liberty, like positive music, uplifting music, pan-African music, music, class-conscious music about the struggles of the people, them. And he, and back before that, he was a rock dance hall type, you know, and you know, hey, go talk to your West Indian friends because they get real particular about the enunciations and the, and, the, and the proper classifications. I don't claim to be an expert. I was just a Yankee boy and I did club, you know, I, I you know, but, so he had moved on beyond that, but that was still part of his repertoire. And I, and the dude said to me, you know, the Trini man, he was from Trinidad. And uh, he told me, you know, that song has real world repercussions. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He was like, yo, they literally boom, bye, bye. They like kill homosexuals in the West Indies. Now I had never been to the West Indies. And I knew one Jamaican dude growing up that moved to, I don't know why this family moved to Missouri. When all the Jamaicans moved to Brooklyn and, and, and Florida, and there was one Jamaican dude named Vester that grew up, that lived in my projects. You know, a little runty guy. And he used to always, he was really, really, really into battery operated remote control cars. He loved remote control cars, but he never had batteries. So we'd be hanging around and best to come up like, yo, our batteries. And this dude's like, 
seven years old with a deep raga voice. Yo, y'all batteries. Yo, I need batteries. And we were like, nobody got no damn ba batteries, Bester. Get the hell out of here, man. Go on, Bester, scat. You're not batteries. You're not batteries. And that's all I knew about Jamaicans is that they, you know, he was the ambassador of all of Jamaica to me. All I knew is that they love remote control cars and they never had no batteries and they always ask him about batteries. So when I moved to New York, it was a bit of a culture shock. A good culture shock though, like a culture invigoration. When I got to New York and I learned about uh, Guyanese and Guyanese and Chinese and Big John, Puerto Rican. And I learned that people of Latinx descent were allowed to say nigga in New York. Almost, that was my first New York City fist fight where a Puerto Rican dude called me a nigga. And I'm like, how dare you? So I was ready to throw down because I didn't know. And all the New York dudes was like, yo, that's cool. And I'm like, I don't know where y'all get that from, New York. Another L. New York was taking L's way back in 1992 and 91. But I digress. The Trini man told me, yo, they really, really like lynch homosexuals in Jamaica. I'm like, word? Like, this is a literal song? Because I grew up on, you know, NWA. Gangsta, gangsta, that's what they yelling. It's not about a salary. It's all about reality. A bum rush, but we call it Rat Pack. On a nigga for nothing at all. Ice Cube will go stupid when I'm full of a ball. That's why, so killing black people in music was just everything. That's every, so every other song was about killing black people, killing black people. Even women, you know? Remember? The song, Mind of a Lunatic, Ghetto Boys, Bushwick Bill, when he stalked that woman and murdered her, and then was sitting on next to her corpse on the couch, and then he said, it's time for me to make a decision. Should I live in reality or live in the television? And so I'm just like, yeah, there's murder music everywhere, put out by white multimedia corporations. So I haven't grown up on murder music. You know, it's hard not to kill niggas. It's a full-time job not to kill niggas. And when I heard murder gays, just I brought it right on into the rest of all the rest of the murder music. So I'm like, boom, bye, bye. Okay. So don't, I really like that song. But then all of a sudden, as we progressed, as humanity evolved, as we became more enlightened, we decided that we did not like Boom Bye Bye songs. And Sizzler, burn Sodomite, and burn Elizabeth for them. Can't burn, not burn Sodomite, no Boom Bye Bye. And so I, I was just thinking about this the other night. I hadn't really thought about it. I knew I saw the music fade. Sizzler, Kalanji said, me not do that no more. Kepotan said, me not do that no more. Buju, so I mean, I do that no more. Okay, well and good. But then even some of those artists, they, they had also, even Sizzler, had murder music. Where they're killing black people in the songs. And Snoop Doggy Dogg been killing black people in music for decades, and he's on corporate media with Martha Stewart baking crumpets or whatever. Ice Cube is a wholesome Disney father and he's killed so many black people in music. He's a murder rap to keep you dancing with a crime record like Charles Manson. AK-47 is the tool. Blah, blah, blah. Don't make me act a fool. So I'm like, hmm. So you, you not do no boom bye bye, but even if you turn, I just talked to Kwabana last night. He's up in Detroit at the Black Engineers Convention. They wanted me to come give a speak to the speech to the black engineers, our future, our our STEM future, but they didn't want to give me transportation or any type of facilitate my arrival. So I said, I can't come. I ain't got it like that. So I don't get it. But anyway, Kwabana is up there to talk to our, to talk to, because he believes the children are the future. He wants to teach them well and help them lead the way, show them all the beauty they possess inside. That's what he's up there to do. But anyway, I talked to Kwabana last night and he's with the Clear the Airways Project. And this brother been out here protesting for years trying to get murder music off of the U.S. airways. And then he goes after the sponsors like McDonald's and the black McDonald's owner organization of black franchise owners 
Now, I think it's kind of reverse. They want McDonald's to stop promoting murder music. I think McDonald's kills more black people than gangsters. You know, you look at the top 10 causes of premature death in black people. Six of the 10 are related to diet, to McDonald's type food and lifestyle. But I digress. Enough respect to Kwabana. I got to get him back on the air. But Kwabana post lyrics. He listens to the, to, to the black radio stations. Now, I'm an NPR type cat. I listen to Q4 radio in my spare time. I listen to progressive talk radio and I listen to like NPR. I, I don't listen to the to the murder murder stations. It just it don't it disaligns my chakras. It lowers my vibration. But he'll post the lyrics to the songs. You know, shoot your mama house, shoot your grandma house, keep shooting till somebody die. I grew up in these streets without no heart. But apparently 21 Savage has turned a new leaf. He's gone from a street level mass murderer to a capitalist promoting capitalists or what they call financial literacy to black people so I guess he wants to elevate his he doesn't want to murder with a with a gun anymore he wants to murder with drone bombs and, and environmental degradation but I continue to digress so I'm like wow you know how is it murder 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 and the murder 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 artists are now icons Jay-Z P. Diddy you know, P. Diddy put out music where Biggie Smalls detailed description of murdering a whole family and raping the child. DMX, you know, broke in the house, raped the dude's daughter in front of him, and then slit the dude's throat. So it's murder music everywhere, but yo, you better make sure whoever you're murdering in your music is a cisgendered heterosexual preferably male six gender heterosexual. You can kill them by the boatloads. So then I'm like, why though? Why are all of a sudden white people get this sudden burst of humanity? And I figured it out just last night. When you say kill the homosexuals, that could include white people. White people fall under that umbrella. They fit in that bucket. And you can't have black people making music saying kill indiscriminate people. That's what they call what Dr. Claude Anderson said. He said there are vertical issues and there are horizontal issues. He said the horizontal issues are the race issues, the issues that are specific to race. And the vertical issues are issues that apply to everybody. So horizontal issues often intersect with black issues. So you have black issues, racism. And then you have homosexuality, where that's a vertical issue because there is homosexuals everywhere, in every category, or LGBTQAI. And everybody applies to that. So you can say, kill niggas, shoot niggas, burn niggas, sell drugs to niggas, rob niggas, hate niggas. You can say that. That's horizontal. But then if you say, kill gays, then you could be talking about killing Australians, Canadians, fin New Finlanders, <laughs> Swedes, Brits, Germans, French. There's a lot of white people that identify as that. So they go so far as, as, as not allowing the, the reggae artist visas to travel. They tell Buju and, and Sisla Kalanji and Kiepotan, people don't know say I'm a friend. They tell these artists, you can't have a visa to travel to Europe because you said, boom, bye, bye. You're, you're not like gay, not chichi man, uh, 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 gays. You're anti-gay music. But then, Jay-Z, hard not to kill niggas. It's like a full-time job not to kill niggas. Gets to, not only gets his passport and his visa to travel to do concerts in Europe, they turn over the Louvre, their most iconic cultural institutions for him to shoot rap videos in. And Beyonce, she's not exempt. Bow down, bitches. Classism. Telling b black women to bow down while she's wearing European Victorian queen clothes. So it's not really morality. It's not really. And I went and looked at some of the issues specific to black LGBT. And we're finding out that all of this, even though Dr. Umar told us that the gays are taking over, Dr. Umar said that the gay agenda is turning everybody gay, I go to find that 
the representation of gays or the percentage of people that identify as gay, lesbian, trans has not increased from the time that it was uh, repressed and, and persecuted up till now has not decreased, has not increased. So the gay agenda has succeeded in giving gay people more visibility and more mobility, but it has not in, it succeeded in turning us heterosexuals gay. In fact, we do better turning gays straight. Remember uh, Antoine Dobson? We, we, we got him back, a successful conversion from gay to straight. And that other delivered, I am delivered. We still got him. He still likes women, women, women's. He said, he said in his own words, he gets hard for women, not for men's. So we got him. So we're, we're actually winning on that side. We lost on the side of that we can't gleefully celebrate the wanton murder of gays. But if you're into wanton murder, there's still a, a, a F ton. There's whole genres. There's whole radio stations dedicated to wanton murder of black people, most likely poor, under-resourced, oppressed black people. There's a whole genre of music, drill music, gangster rap dedicated to their wanton murder and savaging these people. So you don't, there's, it's not as though you have no music, but you just can't do it. You say, you know, I killed him because he was a mark. I killed him because he was an op. I killed him because he was a buster. I killed him because he was a rival. Just can't kill people because they're gay. There's lots of reasons you can kill people in music, black people specifically. Just can't do it because they're gay. But you can find another reason. But like I said, that's my theory is why the boom bye-bye has gone bye-bye. It's because you can't have black people making music that could potentially suggest that black people do violence or target white people. But you can make all the music. You can be a mega superstar. You can be a household name. Even my wife went into this. She's in, she went to Arizona for some academic conference. And she had some Intelligentsia coffee. So now Intelligentsia coffee is the only coffee she drinks. She's a coffee snob. So she, we went to uh, Intelligentsia, which is like downtown, like right up the block from the art center. It's, it's, it's the most, you know, affluent, bourgeois area. It's right by the, the, the symphony and all this upper class white, all the theater air district and the arts district of, of Chicago. Rich white, richy snooty white people. And she had these tokens where she can hustle up. I don't know. She She's like a suburban hustler. My wife is like a suburban hustler. You know, she she can't she can't flip the flip a brick. But she know how to hustle up on some organic vegan lattes. She always like, uh, We'll be out somewhere, and she's like, let's go to Intelligentsia. I got this, this, this coupon, this code, this coin, where we can get a free vegan latte. So, you know, I don't, I don't get no street-level perks or hustles, but we get all the suburban, upper-class, nerdy quirk, you know, free museum passes or theater passes. That's the kind of stuff she'd know how to hustle up and grind on. Anyway. We go in there. She goes in there. I wait in the car because I'm too hood for that kind of stuff. I'm like, get me back to the south side. Like, why doesn't Tudson say, get me back into the ghetto? Your culture of freedom. That's, that's me. So I'm like, I'm going to wait in the car because I'm just too hood. I don't want to go in there scaring them white folks. Being as hood as I am, you go in that snooty intelligence your coffee place and you get our vegan, organic, non-GMO soy latte while I wait in the car. So she goes in there, and they're playing, like, gangster rap. And she gets offended, and that's why she knows she's going to get her coffee spinning, because she makes a comment, like, all these, you know, affluent white people in here listening to black music. It's like a modern-day minstrel show, because when they used to have the black pe performers come out, they black people could perform on stage, but they couldn't sit in the audience. And white people used to like to see. Sammy Davis Jr. used to have to perform. When he was a kid, he performed in blackface. So even if your face was already black, they still would make you paint your face with blacker face. And he'd get up there and tat dance and sing the old Dixie song. And white people would sit out in the audience drinking and, 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 and enjoying themselves while we're on stage. So we, we can't come in there to enjoy the facilities, but we can come there to in, entertain white people. So she said they were like playing Biggie Smalls Ready to Die. Or something like that. 
or, or maybe uh, Life After Death, your reign on the top was short like leprechauns as I crush so-called really thugs and rapidons. Get in that ass quick fast like Ramadan. It's the rap phenomenon, Don Dota. Biggie was always better than Tupac. I'm going to stand on that, but I digress. And so she made a comment. She said something to the barista, and then she said she overheard some white guy. Said something like, you know, keep it a buck, keep it 100, a guy keeps it real. Say some ghetto tagline he heard, or black vernacular, black, black lingo that he heard. And my wife, she just can't not say nothing. Gonna get my latte spit in, in there, you know, cussing out white people. So white people have no problems with listening to black death. But they have a problem if they listen to black death that might scoop them into it. Like, I can't listen to no black man talk about. Now, they can go to the movies and watch Schwarzenegger and just kill every white boy, kill, you know, but, you know, they don't want their subordinates acting out. So, goodbye, taboom, bye-bye. You will live on in, in, in the hearts of many of us. But now I, I think I've, I've pretty much solved that puzzle. Maybe if the reggae artist said boom, bye, bye, and, and maybe start saying gay niggas. Because you could say nigga kill niggas, but you can't say kill gays. But maybe you can say kill gay niggas if you could specify that the gays you want to kill, mutilate, and brutalize are black gays. Maybe they'll let us come back with the boom, bye, bye era or the boom, bye, bye music. So it's not really about justice. This is, again, about racial hierarchy, about superiority. And also, as I was about to say, we find that, gay L that the gay LGBTQ are not enjoying all of the benefits for, or any of the benefits of the gay rights movement. Gay right, gays got the right to serve in the U.S. military openly. Trans, well, the trans ban is... But the Pentagon, is, it's, it's, uh, it's up in the air with the trans ban. I don't know if the trans ban will have an opportunity to go out and kill and slaughter for the empire. But you can be gay. They abolish don't ask, don't tell. You can openly be, who, be all that you can be and be who you want to be in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and go around the world slaughtering people as your true self. Now, they still find out that in the U.S. Armed forces, forces, if you go back and study the research of the late John Judge, that black people are more likely to be court-martialed, black people are less likely to get promotion, black people are more likely to be brutalized. You know, they had that black woman that was in Iraq that was raped, and then after they, she was raped and murdered, they poured acid on her genitals to, to destroy any DNA evidence from her rapist, and they, they ruled her death a suicide. So they find out that even though you can be openly gay, also the gays still, black gays still get the, all of the compounding uh, negative consequences of being black in the military. You're still black. So black gay LGBTQ people that are enjoying the, 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 the policy reform and the same thing with gay marriage. It's coming to understand that marriage is a, becomes a class issue and that there are economic hurdles to, to people getting married. And they find that poor people, it's not that poor people have lower values, poor people are less moral, poor people are less committed to their partners. We find that, that as everything in this uh, nation, healthy food, decent housing, education, and marriage and, and family stability comes with an economic hurdle comes with an economic uh, uh, limitations. And so since black people that happen to be gay are just as poor as all other black people, they find that get black gays, even though we see all these wonderful images that the, all these liberals and progressive post online of these big elaborate gay marriages, that the average gay black person ain't got the money, the resources to go have an elaborate wedding and that their marriage rates pretty much reflect their class status in the nation just like all other black people. And issues of police brutality and incarceration, they're finding that trans LGBTQ black people that commit major or minor offenses get harsher sentences than the whites. 
so that's again where Dr. Clark said you gotta when you're fighting for something, you gotta say, I'm fighting for black dot 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 dot. You can't fight for human rights, for gay rights, for homeless rights, for immigrant rights. You gotta fight for black, gay, black human because if if when they tend to open up the 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 the, the treasure chest for these marginalized groups. Black people still cur carry the burden of being black, even if you no longer have to carry the burden of being gay. Even if you have to no longer carry the cur uh, burden of being disabled. Even if you have to no longer carry the burden of being a religious minority. If you are black, you still get the compounds. And then the, your, your fellow gay, white gays, white disabled, white fringe people that get this concessions, you find that those populations are just as racist. I hate bringing this up all the time. I know maybe some of y'all are tired of hearing this, but it's true. But if you go to these gay utopias of San Francisco or here in Boys Town or other gay communities in, in, in the, uh, in the, on the West Coast, the Northwest, you'll find that the gays are racist, exclusionary, bigoted, prejudiced against black people. And they create laws and, and, and civic policies to try to gentrify and exclude blacks. Even black people who fall into the otherwise the same category, the same lifestyle, the same uh, uh, gender identities as they do. So they're finding that gays, black gay people, still levels of homelessness, suicide, incarceration, Alienation is pretty much the same. So it hasn't been a windfall. So there, there you have it. It's kind of like why I could never really get with, been a vegan for over 20 years, but I could never really get with the whole vegan, mainstream vegan movement. Because I'm black. And so now that McDonald's and Wendy's and all this progress, I admit, veganism has come a long way. When I first became a vegan back in 1992, it, was, it, was, it wasn't pretty out there for us. You know, I was eating out of wooden barrels. Now all these vegan items and all these vegan friendly and you can walk somewhere and people say I'm vegan and people don't look at you like what? But still, I'm still black. So, I'm just saying, not that I'm comparing being vegan to being LGBTQ. I'm just saying, any issue that is of value to you, any identity that you have, if it's not encapsulated in your blackness, or you think having this in common with non-black people will allow you to transcend your blackness. I'm vegan, and I, so I can go roll with the white vegans. I'm LGBTQI, so I can encapsulate and join the LGBT and encapsulate. You know, it's just, you know, you don't escape. Ain't no sanctuary. We're well, moving on. Say, say goodbye to Boom Bye Bye. They're trying to purge the internet. So if you want to have some anti-chichiman music, you, you better go burn it on a CD or something, because the internet will be purged. But like I said, if you still have a, a deep-seated desire to hear murder music, there's plenty of it out there. That is still bought, sold, and, and profited by white multinational corporations. Moving on. Speaking of murder, murder, and murder, I was going to play Dead End Street by Mad Cobra. Just to demonstrate how reggae music has a lot of homicidal murder music in uh, reggae. Dead End Street. But then I'm like, no, I'm going to come with the Sheung. I'm going to come with the Fela Legacy because I want to uplift the people them. But anyway, speaking of murder, Shoddy has pled guilty to charges racketeering, gun trafficking, and general criminality. And if you don't know who Shadi is, I'm sure you know who Takashi 69. Takashi 69, who was, as we all should have known, was a fake studio thug. But what made this fake studio thug dangerous is he was backed by actual criminals, actual murderers, actual gangbangers. 
and they got behind him and surrounded him and allowed him to go around the country, nay, around the world, provoking violence and threatening violence against other black people. And they would say, you can't, and they made Takashi untouchable because real criminals saw him as a cash cow. But of course, that house of cards came a tumbling down and these real criminals got with a known perpetrator, with a known front and fake studio gangster, and then got the nerve to be mad when the fake studio gangster, like I said, if you see me sitting in a corner playing with a poisonous viper, and you say to me several times, bro, Diallo, leave that poisonous viper alone, and I'm like, no, I'm getting money with this viper. And then you come by the next day, and I'm sitting there foaming at the mouth, poisoned from viper venom. You gonna weep for me? Some of y'all would. Some of y'all would pray and weep for me. But anyway, Shadi pled guilty from Takashi's because I guess he knew it was over. The feds had taps. The feds had Takashi singing like a, a, a cage bird. I know why the cage Takashi sings. And it turns out that he was engaged in several criminal as they're putting out the charges that he pled guilty to. Basically, he preyed upon black people. And let me tell y'all something. I know how much y'all love. They just about to come out with another movie about Bumpy Johnson. Y'all love gangsters. But I have to inform the community that gangsters are Uncle Toms. Gangsters are petty capitalists. Gangsters are subversive and counter to revolution and black liberation. Do you hear me? Gangsters are assets of our oppressors. That's why when we form groups like the UNIA, the Black Gorilla Family, Black Panther Parties, I ain't got a list of alphabet soup of progressive, revolutionary, even just positive, uplifting black organizations, and the government comes and blows them up. They have COINTELPRO. And let me tell you something about these black organizations. The Black Panther was founded by scholars. Bobby Seale was an engineer. Huey P. was a law student and went on to secure his PhD. Fred Hampton didn't have a formal degree, but if you listen to the man or read his writing, he was one of the most rare read young men of his generation. It was founded by intelligent scholars. Mm -hmm. People who understand not only the national law, but understood international law, that knew what their limitations were. And so, but still, they get in and subvert these organizations. But when it comes to the Bloods, the Crips, the folks, they go on and proliferate for generations. They know how to destroy black organizations that are trying to liberate us. But black organizations, as they, you know, a lot of people try to glamorize these street gangs. Now they call street gangs street organizations or street tribes trying to whitewash the level of damage. Now, I don't care about black people breaking laws of the United States, breaking constitutional laws, breaking local law. I don't care about that. I'm like, y'all, I celebrate, you know, like Nas said, I go to the movies and root for the villain. I don't care about, I do not weep for the violation of American laws. That's not my issue with the street gangster thug community. I care about preying upon black people and disrupting the cohesion, the unity, what level of stability and cooperation we're able to build and causing us to be unnecessarily distressed within our own spaces, which makes it harder for us to pool our resources and coordinate our efforts to fight our oppression. And if you study revolutionary and guerrilla movements, all of the guerrilla movements, I don't care if you're talking about Bolivia, Cuba, I don't care if you're talking about the, 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 the Bolivarian Revolution. You're talking about the Vietnamese guerrilla movement. One of the first thing, there's a book by John Lee Anderson called Guerrillas. One of the first thing the revolutionary movements knew they had to do 
is to deal with the internal predatory elements. If they were going to revolutionize their people, if they were going to mobilize their people to fight a, a colonizer, to fight an enslaver, to fight an oppressor, they knew they had to deal with the internal criminal element first. If not first, then during the movement. Because those are always the first ones that the oppressor, that the colonizer reaches out to. It's all written very clearly in the history. And it's not just black people. No use for us to hold our heads in shame about this issue with the thugs, gangsters, antisocial, psychopaths, petty capitalists that are willing to sell us out and prey upon their own people in order to get the material wealth of, that the oppressor has. It's not just us. If you go look at the, uh, the in Italy, when they wanted to have an Italian socialist state, when the Italian communists fought the fascist, and, the, and, the, and at the end of World War II, the, the, the communists and the socialists and the anarchists were some of the most popular politicians and political parties in Italy. And the reason they were so popular and they were so beloved was because they were the only ones fighting the damn Nazis. They were the only ones putting opposition to the fascists. And so when the, when the Nazis and Mussolini and the brown shirts, they were defeated, the people knew who liberated them. It wasn't uh, uh, John Wayne who rode in on a white horse like the movie said. The Americans, the capitalists, the Brits did not rescue the world from fascism. In fact, they imposed their own form of fascism on the world. It was the Soviet Union. The, common, the communist, the anarchist, those were the ones who fought long and strong. And so the U.S. government said, well, we can't have communists come to power in Western Europe. So they started this thing called Operation Gladio, where they would do false flag terrorism and say it was the anarchists and, and turn the people against the anarchists, the socialists, and the communists. And they employed the Sicilian gangsters, the mafiosos, were the ones who carried out the act, the false flag act. And they would put on the headbands and the armbands of the socialist and go in and kill people and terrorize people in the name of Mother Russia. It was the gangsters when they went into Africa and there was a decolonization movement. And they were like, we're going to get these Europeans out of Africa. We're going to erect our own independent African nations and we're going to take control of our natural resources. The first place the first people, the first population that the colonists reached out to when they were losing the fight were the criminal elements, the thugs, the gangsters. Same thing here when they wanted to bring down the Panthers. Same thing Malcolm X told us out of his own mouth. The Nation of Islam was a good thing. It was a growing movement until the criminals, until the thugs got into it and took it over that still run the nation to this day. So it really pains me, number one, to see the community as a whole celebrating thugging, thugging, taking on the rhetoric, the aesthetic, the, the attitude and disposition, secure the bag, flip a brick, all this rhetoric from the criminal elements. Even though you got to know, we've got access to the documents. These criminal thugs don't threaten the state. They don't threaten the national security. They don't threaten the capitalist. Oh, nonviolent, pray for my for and, and, and want to be integrated. Dr. King was more of a threat to the to the status quo. They were more afraid and threatened by Dr. King's nonviolent action than the, all of the black gangsters combined. They never see them as a threat because they aren't a threat. They are an asset. The byproduct of black criminality, petty capitalism, is a disunified, distrustful, fearful, confused black population. But now we got this character named Shoddy, and everybody's like, oh, Takashi 6 9 snitch. So you hate snitching, unless it's two Nigerians snitching on a Smollett then you don't care about snitching. Unless it's your beloved criminal enterprise, Nike Inc., snitching on Avenatti, then you don't care about it. So you're, very, you're only mad when somebody snitches on somebody that's doing predatory behavior towards blacks. 
And if I'm wrong about that, show me where this outrage about snitching came about in any other scenario. And I can correct my conclusion. So anyway, Shadi pleads guilty. He's going to spend the rest of his youth and if not the rest of his life in a federal prison. And black people are legit like, oh, this is a tragedy. I think it is a tragedy. I don't think it's a tragedy in how it came out. I think the whole evolution where black men have adopted the attitudes and behaviors of our oppressor. That's the tragedy. And Shadi, who's obviously an intelligent young brother, who's obviously an incapable young brother, who's obviously a really good, has really good business insights, has really good organizational skills and management skills. And instead of fighting for the, 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 the liberation of African people, instead of using violence to harm our enemies, to bring retribution upon those who abuse and prey upon us, he decided to prey upon us. But it doesn't matter. He'll be a folk hero. It's just like Rick Ross. You'll have 20, 30 years from now, some young rapper, degenerate, come up and call himself, I'm the new shoddy. As shoddy sits in prison like Rick Ross named himself after uh, Free Ray Ricky Ross. He'll be a folk hero. As the freedom fighters, as the revolutionaries continue to struggle on our behalf in, in obscurity, in utter poverty. We'll continue to enrich the predatory parasite blacks who prey on, prey on us and treat us little better than the white predators. So anyway, shoddy got time. Y'all probably going to march. Y'all march for Meek Mill. We Meek Mill flossing diamonds and burning and throwing money. And he comes out of one of the most violent and impoverished cities in all of the black communities in all of America, and he gets on the media and say, I don't care nothing about black people. I don't give up. It's my money. I'm getting paid. But he's going to help us reform prison. I ain't heard him say one, I ain't heard him say anything about the political prisons, but he wants to perform, reform the, the prison system. I don't know how you're going to be social justice and, and materialistic and capitalistic all rolled into one ball. Good luck with that. Moving on, talking about criminality, Smollett, Jesse Smollett. I did a show called Jesse's Lies Expose Some Truths. I don't remember. Let me, let me, I got to find the actual name of that. I got a lot to talk about. So much going on, man. What did I say? Oh, Jesse's Lies Expose Some Truths. Jesse did us a wonderful solid. By being a cele black celebrity and at the center of this nonsense. Jesse's lies didn't just expose that a lot of black people still have plantation politics and slave mentalities, which we already knew, but sometimes it's even if you know something's going on, when you see it, it's written all over your face. I mean, it's kind of hard to ignore. But Jesse Smollett, Blacklash, has exposed white fragility, white hostility, and white hypocrisy. White folks are the biggest freaking hypocrites. And let me tell you, my wife was like, did you tell the people about this? She wanted me to tell y'all this, what happened to me last weekend. My wife wears glasses. She's a nerd, I told y'all. But she wears prescription glasses. And she had an issue with one of her lenses. So she was going to lens crafters. And the lens crafters, down on Roosevelt, y'all know it's like a strip mall type thing where there's like an old Navy H&M, uh, 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 a pizza place, uh, lens crafters, all in this little complex. And there's also like a yoga studio and a whole bunch of movie theaters, just all this. I, we don't go there very often, but she's like, there's a lens crafters right there. So she had actually told me like on three different occasions, I had to get these glasses fixed. So just the wrong day on the wrong time, she, I, I said, okay, let's, let's, let's go get the, the glasses fixed. So I pull in, and I don't know if y'all been into that underground parking lot that serves this strip mall. It's very tight parking. I don't know why they paint the line so close. It's like, but anyway, I'm pulling into a parking site behind this other car. And I'm pulling in forward, and the car in, for, in front of me had backed in. So I'm pulling up to the rear of this car. And as I'm pulling into the slot, this white woman 
in tie-dye yoga pants, steps between my car and her car, her rear bumper and the front of my bumper. And I even thought to myself, why I'm pulling in? Why would she do that? She sees that I'm pulling in. She wasn't even out, out of the car when I made the turn. Why would she just jump between cars? Not that she was ever in any danger, but you know, you see two cars converging. You usually wait till it comes to a full stop before you. But anyway, I thought it was weird, but whatever. So she opens her trunk. I put the car in park, proceed to get out, and she turns to me and says, back your car up in the most hostile manner. So I look at her and I say, excuse me, from inside the car. Then she starts motioning her arm, back up your car. So then I'm getting out of the car because I had already turned off the car and put the keys, and I'm a bit perplexed while she's scowling at me. So I get out of the car and I'm like, what's your problem? She says, uh, I can't close my trunk. You're too close to my car. And I said, you could totally close your trunk. I'm still being cool. I'm like, you, you could totally. Go ahead, close it. And so she pauses. She didn't want to close her trunk because she just told a, a lie. And she knew it was an obvious lie. She's literally standing between the two cars. So she slams her trunk shut. And then she looks at me and says, you hit me. And I'm like, lady, I did not hit you. Yes, you, you, you hit me. I'm like, why is this woman just making up lies on the spot? And then another older white lady comes around, who's also dressed in yoga attire, and was like, you pull too close. And I'm like, I'm not too close. There's plenty. And I'm trying to be cool. And so then they really messed up because then they gave my wife enough time to get her stuff together because she was still in the car gathering her stuff. So she lied and said I was too close. She couldn't close her trunk. First, she told me to back up. And I'm like, I'm not moving my car. I'm parked. Then she said, I can't close my trunk. You're too close to my car. I said, you have more than enough room. She told her car trunk and there was no, it was a hatchback. No near, didn't, was, was a foot away from that. Nowhere near my car. Then she said, I hit her when I was pulling in. Did not come into contact with her. In fact, when I saw her step between the cars, I stopped further back from her car than I would have otherwise. And I thought, why would she get in between the cars? And while I was parking the car, she did not turn around. She didn't react. I didn't hit her. She knew it was a lie. And so then my wife gets out and like, what's, what the hell? She, she hadn't even peeped the whole thing. So she immediately starts to check these women. And so then the woman says, you're over the line. And I only told you to move your car because I didn't want you to get a ticket. I was trying to help you after my wife started getting in a grill. And I'm like, Wow. And then what he really realized to me is I have been sheltered. And then my wife starts to say some stuff like, yeah, go ahead, call the police. Let's break out the cameras. Let's do this whole thing. Y'all want to do this dance? You want to be internet famous? She starts taunting them and harassing them. Poor white women. I said a prayer for them when I got home because they had to deal with Dr. Mingo. So she's like, the, she turned the tables on them. She started checking them and was like, let's, let's get off the phones. Barbecue Becky, we got a new hashtag on, on deck. Go ahead, call the police. And I'm like, will you still stop telling these white women to call the police? I don't want to take that gamble. You gambling with my life. Stop it. But anyway, it made me realize something. I have been sheltered. The white people that I know are like the fringe white people, like anarcho-socialist, deep green resistant, radical white people. I ain't saying I know a lot of white people. But the few I know tend to be the fringe white people. This is like my first Walmart yoga pants, you know, pumpkin spice type interaction. And since I can remember, since I can remember, you know, I live in the hood. I live in all black neighborhoods. I kind of dwell in, and it ain't, it ain't even kind. It's just second nature. I don't even know how you, how these people that get, like, there used to be a lot of YouTube videos and, and, and Facebook posts that people had about being the only black. I'm the only black in my school. I'm the only black at my job. I'm the only black in my neighborhood. I'm the only black. I've never been that only black. I don't know what you got to do to be the only black. I don't know how much money you got to have, how much education you got to have. I don't know how, I don't know what you do. I don't know how to become that. I've never been the only black. Everywhere I go. I can't get away from black folks. So this is kind of like my first experience. I kind of dwell in the world. I don't mess with people. And people don't tend to mess with me.
People say I look mean. You know, I'm 6'3", but I'm not a bulking 6'3". I'm a slender 6'3". And I kind of walk in the world. I got this, this bubble, black man bubble that we have. That I think, brothers, we don't really appreciate it. Because if you carry yourself a certain way, people kind of leave you alone. If you have kind of a, a disposition, it's, you kind of navigate the world and people stay away from you. And you know, this incident, I've been in Chicago 10 years, never had anything like this happen to me. Never came close to being a hashtag. Yeah, I've been handcuffed and detained and laid on police cars, being black, trying to do things for black people. You know, but cops is a different breed. It's a special species of whiteness. So I'm used to dealing with cops. But regular white civilians coming at you like that, this, this was a relatively rare phenomenon. And I blame Jesse Smollett. Jesse Smollett, as I think Chris posted, Chris Marshall posted the other day, Chronicles of Nigger He said that Smollett is the new OJ. White folks are outraged. And what has white people so outraged? That they got a little taste of their own medicine. Now, black people, we see our family members brutalized and murdered right before our eyes on camera. And the person walks out of jail. The person, the cop, walks out of jail. The vigilante walks out of jail. And they spend hundreds of millions of dollars. And not only do they kill our, our people, exonerate the murderer, then they start to spray uh, a tear gas us in the street when we're just marching in protest of it. So black people, we know all about false accusations, being demonized. We know all about criminals who do us wrong, walking out of the courtroom with a smug grin on their faces, mocking not only justice, but mocking our very existence, mocking our very humanity. We know what that's like. But white people get a little taste of false accusation and exoneration and they have lost their collective mind. We got a Republican state rep by the name of Michael McAlufi, McAlufi, whatever. He's introducing a tax, uh, introducing a legislative bill to be voted on by the state legisl legislator. And if you knew the kind of economic infrastructure mess that the state of Illinois is in. This state is a freaking basket case, and it shouldn't be. This state sits on so many, they stole, I mean, this is one of the best things they ever stole from the Native Americans. The ecosystem here, the, the fertile land that they grow here, the wind farms, the Great Lakes regions, they had a, a, a whole fishing industry. White people, when they stole this territory from the Native Americans, from the Iroquois Confederacy, when they stole this land, they stole a mint. And the, the white people took a lush, fertile, viable land and have turned it into an economic backward racist hole called Illinois. And with all the problems that are in this state, the legislators that y'all elected got time to introduce a bill to withhold tax credits for any production company that works with Empire actor Jesse Smollett. So you got a person-specific legislation. They haven't done this since they wrote a, a bill to censure a, a citizen, uh, uh, what's his name, Khalid Muhammad. They're so outraged. Now, ain't been no state bills. The police have been found to torture, murder, for hire, robbing drug dealers and citizens of their property. I ain't seen no outrage from the legislature. Now, and also what I'm pissed off at is why are his Fox that is over Empire, a multi-billion dollar media corporation, Comcast and all these multi-billion dollars. Why the hell are they getting tax credits in the first cotton picking place? That was more outrageous. Well, I don't know which is more outrageous. I don't think any of these corporations should be getting tax credits for any damn thing. And they come to the city, they obstruct traffic, 
They're always shooting. Remember when they were shooting Transformers here? Transformer 1 and 2? And everywhere I go, they're shooting episodes and everywhere all over the city. And they come to the hood because the hood is all blighted. It looks like a war zone when they want to show a depressed area for white people's oppression porn. They come to my community setting up these big ass trailers, emitting all these pollution with these big ass generators. They setting up these big lights. They're always in one, some random high park mansion. Why the hell is any multinational corporation getting tax credits from the uh, bankrupt state government? from the bankrupt state treasury. Why, to hell with Jesse Smollett. Don't get, cut all tax credits to all corporations. What the blood clot? It's a mad, mad world. Quit electing these damn inbred hick idiots. What the hell? But hey, their ignorance, like Gil Scott Heron said, these politicians, the stupidity of these politicians is only surpassed by the people who vote for them. And talking about Smollett, again, the Chicago Police Department has ran to the feds. Ran to the feds and want the feds to open up an investigation into Jesse Smollett. The Chicago Police Department requested. Now let me tell you how crazy this is. In 2017, after a decades long uh, reports, more than 50 years of uh, the, the, in 2017, there was a report released by the federal FBI and the Justice Department on the Chicago Police Department. And this investigation went back 50 years and has recorded, documented more than half a century of unlawfulness, corruption of the Chicago Police Department. And so the Chicago Police Department, of course, the tail end of the Obama administration came under what was called a consent decree. Because it was out of hand, the crimes of the Chicago Police Department, the corruption of the Chicago Police Department. City taxpayers have paid more than 700 and 60 million, 760 million dollars to settle for improper police conduct. Everything from rapes, murder, torture, extortion, property damage. 700, we have paid out to other citizens. Basically, we have paid out for police misconduct. We are paying for the police abuse of us. That doesn't count. The $760 million doesn't count towards the police budget. The pension for the police, the payroll for the police, the equipment and vehicles for the police, the facilities for the police, the training for the police, that's all separate. In addition to paying for all of that, we had to pay on top of that $760 million for police misconduct. This, in 2018, it was over $50 million just for one year. And the same amount they had to pay for misconduct is the exact same amount they cut from the education budget. The government said for nearly 50 years, reviews of the Chicago Police Department have identified significant failures by the CPD to act lawfully and protect and serve all Chicago residents equally and fairly. In 1973, a blue ribbon panel found that the police misconduct was directed more often at people of color. What the hell is a people of color? In the years since, other significant investigations have identified racially discriminatory policing practices as well as widespread police abuse. This conduct has unquestionably hit African American and Latino residents the hardest. Mistrust between Chicago residents and police reached a boiling point in November of 2015 after a video was released showing the LaQuinn McDonald murder. So these, and so they came under a consent decree, which meant that an independent federal agent would come in and oversee the police. 
And the police would have to do regular reports and start keeping statistics about integration. The police department basically had to be police. We not only had to pay with our tax dollars for the police, we had to pay for the police to be police. But fortunately, for the police, for the pigs, for the murderers, for Eddie Johnson, Bill, uh, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump was elected president, by, not by the people. He won a minority. This is not a democracy. This is an oligarchy because he lost to Hillary Clinton by over 3 million votes. And I don't know. Last I checked, 3 million was a hell of a number. Big numbers. He lost to Hillary but won the Electoral College. He appointed this known racist Jeff Sessions as Attorney General. Attorney General, the Justice oversees the Justice Department. The Justice Department oversees the consent decree which would police the police. And Jeff Sessions says, hey, I'm a stinking, inbred, white racist. So of course, I'm not gonna go at the police. White racist, white people love the police until the police come and step on their neck and raise their, their meth lab. But you know, white people, nobody could ever blame them or accuse them of consistency. Like I said, hostility and hypocrisy. If I had to use two words to describe the white masses, hostile and hypocritical. So he says, I'm not enforcing the consent decree. It's still out there. It's still on the book. There's no enforcement. There has been no advancement. There has been no budget. There has been no one appointed to oversee. And the police want Jesse Smollett to pay them back $130,000 that they spent investigating his accusations. I want the police department to pay back the citizens of Chicago 760 million. Start with the 50 million y'all cost us last year for brutalizing in your crime. The Chicago Police Department is a criminal enterprise. It is a criminal gang that does not deserve the respect of anyone. And let's talk about how effective, you know how they were on. Oh yeah, they fumbled. The Chicago homicide clearance rate, the percentage of cases in which the police arrest are or arrest or identify a suspect fell from 17.1 in 2017 to 15.4 for the first six months of uh, 2018. The data shows that if the rate holds through the end, holds through the end of the year, it will be the sixth consecutive annual decline for six years. The police, as they get more and more money, more and more surveillance equipment, more and more positive legislations that allow them to uh, keep their boot on our necks, the less effective they are. And all that 17.1, blah, blah, blah. The real number is, where is it? Oh, out of every... 10 homicides committed in the city of Chicago, seven of them go completely unsolved. Now, this is a police department that had no trouble taking down Fred Hampton and utterly obliterating the, the Black Panther Party. When it comes to, to, to taking down our freedom fighters, sending our freedom fighters into exile, very efficient, very effective. But the people killing our sons, our daughters, and a lot of people say they don't catch them because it's the cops that are doing it. That's the consistency on the streets, in these ravaged communities in, on the south side of Chicago and the west side of Chicago. And when I say 10 in reality, in terms of solving, because a lot of times they'll have a suspect, there's a murder, a rape, they, they'll have a suspect, they'll investigate, and this, the, eventually the case gets dropped. It says here, the Chicago Police Department solved one in 20 homicides. And that means they find this, the murderer, they convict the murderer, and the murderer is held accountable for, for the murder. One in 20. One in 20. That's the police department statistics. And we got to pay them 700. And people say, oh, they got to use those tactics. They got to bust heads and kick some ass in order to maintain law. 
in order to get the job done. Dirty Harry stuff. We got all these movies of these cops breaking the law in order to enforce the law. And we find out that they're incompetent. Keystone cops. Keystone freaking cops. But they got time for Jesse. They got time today. The feds can't enforce, can't stop state sanctioned criminals. Right now, to this day, the Chicago Police Department has its own Guantanamo Bay, has its own torture chamber where they go and torture suspects. And even with all the corrupt, even with all the false convictions, they still can't get the, 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 the uh, homicide clearance rate up above one out of 20. And again, all of this, this the consent decree, the Chicago homicide clearance rate, all of this I got from the government. I didn't go get this from the cats in the streets. I didn't go get this from Sawnetter Television. Because I knew y'all wouldn't believe. I went and got this from the horse's mouth, as they say. I wish I could say it. F the police. F12. I wish I could cuss. The only good thing N.W.A. ever did was put that into the genre. But I don't even like the F the police song because if you listen to the specific lyrics, they're saying F the police because the police won't allow them to freely prey upon black people. I don't give a damn. I value my people. Black lives matter. And I don't want anybody exploiting, preying upon, or, 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 or leveling violence against my people. I don't care if you are a white racist cop or a black a gangbanger trying to secure the bag. I just want to say some good things. The U.S. empire is losing. Before I go to my topic. The U.S. empire is taking L's. Let me just, I'll, maybe we'll go into this later. But the U.S. empire has lost in Syria, is losing in Venezuela, is losing in Afghanistan, is losing in Iran, has lost in Iraq, and lost in the Ukraine. That's just off the cuff. The U.S. empire is taking major L's and we should be dancing in the streets celebrating that the U.S. empire, the PNAC, the project for a new American century, Obama's neoliberalism, Bush's neoconservatism, and, and uh, Trump's kleptocracy have all taken major L's. So there is a silver lining. And I know some of y'all are so sick. Some of y'all ADOS think that America's loss is at black people's loss. But I can't think of a war where black people should, root, should be rooting for the empire, the forces of evil. We are the bad guys. America is the bad guys. And the world should know. The Palestinians, the Congolese, the Venezuelans, the Iraqi people, did I say the Palestinians? Say it again. I think these people need to know that there are people who live within the borders that are citizens of the empire that do not support the imperial agenda. That the federal government is carrying out these genocidal wars of imperialism against our will and against our interests, and we stand in solidarity with the victims of empire, not the imperialists. Stop going up to soldiers in the airport and say thank you for your support. Contact the soldiers in prison. Contact the conscientious objectors, veterans for peace, and tell them thank you for your resistance, not thank you for your service. They are not over there serving us. And if you want to thank anybody, thank the Iraqi insurgents. Thank the Venezuelan freedom fighters. Thank the Congolese and, and, and the Niger Delta resistant fighters. Because those are the people that are preventing the whole world from being slaughtered at a higher rate than it's already being slaughtered. The people on the front lines. Thank the water protectors in the Dakotas. We have nothing to thank these U.S. soldiers for. And if you want to thank a U.S. veteran or a U.S. soldier, go thank Chelsea Manning. That's a soldier. Thank Chelsea Manning for, for, for her service. But I digress. I can't get into that because time ain't on my side. Today's show. <laughs> Today's show. Y'all got me worried, man. Black people, y'all scare me. Y'all frighten me. Because I'm seeing things. I'm hearing things. I'm recognizing things. Let me just say this. I'm, and one thing, I hear black people. And y'all so self-righteous. 
And I'm not, a lot of times, I gotta be specific about who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the black conscious community. I see y'all, y'all, y'all say things and I don't know if y'all understand what y'all saying. Like black people will so casually call for the death penalty. Kill R. Kelly. They find that they, they, there'll be a headline, man murders somebody, man molests a child, woman does this crime, you know, woman abandons child, woman, you know, beats child to death. And black people will jump on social media, hang them, electrocute them, throw them under the jail. Now, this person is just accused of the crime by the same police I just ran down how corrupt and inept these cops are. And then for every story they to have a headline of a black person committing some horrendous crime, there's 10 headlines of some black man coming out of jail after 30 years because of corrupt prosecutor, the corrupt judge, corrupt detectives put him in jail knowing he didn't do it. And I don't understand why black people are so casual about the death penalty and calling for the death penalty. So I see things, I hear things, I see that black people, today's show is called Ideological Regression and political stagnation. Because that's what I see. We are progressing ideologically. Things we used to understand instinctively almost, we are starting to misread. I'm seeing black people flirt with ideologies and concepts and movements and policies that got nothing to do with us or that are contrary to our, our core interest. How is it Back in the 19-teens, not even the 1920s, but the 19-teens, more than 100 years ago, that black people who didn't have the education, who didn't have the resources, who didn't have the social mobility and political capital, were able to accomplish more on a political, social, cultural arena than all of these educated, sophisticated, Learjet flying, Bugatti driving black people we have today. Why are we less effective fighting racism in 2019 than we were in uh, uh, 1959? We haven't even been able to sustain what Dr. King did, let alone build on it. Why are we failing and regressing? We got all this slick talk about Dr. King. I ain't going to march and let white people spit on me. I wish white folks would turn the hoses on me. We got all this slick talk of mockery and disrespect of black people who fought in the civil rights movement. But everything they gained for us, all of the favorable policies, concessions, and legislations that they gained for us, that many of you were born into, didn't have to fight for, didn't have to march for, didn't have to sing for, didn't have to pray for, didn't have to face the water hoses and the police dogs for. Y'all losing it. Y'all fumbling it. Y'all handing it right back to the white people. But y'all got the nerve to talk about, I'm not my ancestors, you can get these hands. And do what with the hands? You can get these hands to flip burgers for you. You can get these hands to, to, to clean your yard. Get these hands to drive an Uber for you. <laughs> Gee, these hands sure ain't fighting against injustice. So why are we ideologically, well, we're, we have political stagnation. Really, we're regressing political Two. So it should be ideological regression and political regression, but that's a bit too redundant. But I'll give it, let's say we're just standing in place. We're not advancing. The more we have materially. But this is a reason. And another thing I see that, that really disturbs me is a lot of black people flirting, flirting with Trumpism. Black people are so proud of themselves, certain segments of the black people, because you say, oh, I don't support the Democrats. And you really think you had your Malcolm X awakening because you're a black person and you no longer support the Democrats. You are like the transition from Detroit Red to Malcolm X. Ah, oh, screw the Democrats. Screw the liberals. And so I see a lot of black people who are hip to the Democratic hustle, and I applaud that. Because black people were, were 90 percentile for the Democrats. And so you move out of that square. But the problem is simply moving out of that square don't mean a damn thing. It really matters where you move. Do you move to the left of the Democratic Party or to the right of the Democratic Party on a political spectrum? 
as is most people seem to be ignorant of what it means, what it truly means, what they don't know what liberal means. They just know it's a bad word. They don't support it. They don't know what conservatism is. They don't understand the right, the leftist political perspective or the right wing political perspective. So a lot of black people I see intelligently, correctly, appropriately abandoning the Democratic Party and shunting liberalism are going towards right wing and conservatism. How the blood clot is that a game? And so I find black people out here like, yeah, Trump is innocent. These stupid Democrats. And I just see all these people who are so proud of themselves that they believe a pathological liar. I knew it was no collusion. There was no proof. The stupid Democrats. Now, first of all, there was totally freaking collusion. I mean, there was freaking collusion. And I, where's the proof? The proof is Trump's own words. The Trump administration had over 100 meetings with the Russians. And you, right before your eyes, there was a crime committed. There was an open agenda to obstruct justice. And then there was a plot to cover up the crimes. And they literally put an attorney general in office who has a history of covering up crimes of past Republican administrations, like the Iran-Contra. So they do it right before your eyes, but you are so sophisticated and you want to be with the edge. You want to be out there with, you want to be with the, I don't know what the hell you're trying to be, but that's a whole nother story. I'm not going to talk this collusion stuff. It was an open cover up. And I mean, they covered up 9-11. They covered up the King assassination, the Kennedy assassination. Trump is a pathological liar. But uh, no collusion. And y'all like, oh, the Democrats are so stupid. But are they? And I'm not pro. I hate that y'all make me have to talk pro-Democrat. But that's kind of like the starting point. That's where we start, at the Democrats. And then we have to figure out, are we going left or right? And what I'm seeing is black people are regressing ideologically and going further to the right. And I'm not saying y'all becoming Clarence Thomases. But there are a lot of black people under the severe delusion that the policies of the Republican Party will somehow benefit them. Some of the main policies that the black people, ideological, ide ideologically confused black people, number one, the issue of immigration. There are a lot of black people that are stupid enough to believe that Trump's immigration po uh, policies will somehow translate into not only employment for black people, but more wages and economic opportunity. They believe that the reason why black people are impoverished and cannot get a political and economic foothold in the United States is because Mexicans are coming here taking our jobs. And true, Mexicans are coming here and getting jobs, but nobody takes jobs. And I don't understand that when we talk about immigrants, we say taking jobs. But if your cousin gets a job as a cashier at Target, he doesn't come home and say, I just took a job. Nobody takes jobs. Whether you're a citizen and a lawful worker or you're an immigrant with a stolen Social Security number, none of that matters. Nobody takes jobs. I don't know why I have to keep saying this. Stop saying they taking our jobs. The job does not belong to you. Even when you sign the W-2 form and you are put on staff and you go through orientation and they put you on the clock and you show up for work, it's still not your job. The job is the property of the owner of the means of production. So if I hire you to do a job, the job is mine and I have granted this thing to you. And at any moment, I can take it away. I can take it from you and give it to somewhere else. Or what's happening more often than not in the modern economy is they are eliminating those t jobs. But if you say the immigrants are being given our jobs, then you have to say, who gave the immigrants your job? Then you have to look at Donald Trump, who hires illegal immigrants. You might have to look at the Koch brothers. You might have to look at all these right wing, right, wealthy, capitalist, racist who are telling black people to attack immigrants and find out that they are the ones hiring, giving the immigrants jobs. Not your jobs, just jobs. But you'd rather beat up on Honduran refugees than fight against rich white men.
because you're punks and you're stupid. Yes, you are stupid. I'm yes, I'm talking about you. I tell you, like Barb Marley said, if the shoe fit, wear it. If you think I'm talking about you, then more likely I am. If you're running around talking about they taking our jobs, it's not your job. And in fact, they're coming into my country. It ain't your damn country. It ain't even the white man's country. And hey, you tell the Native Americans, it don't belong to nobody. That's not our value system. We don't own land. We don't have a concept of private property. That's crazy. Can't own land. What are you talking about? But if you want to accept the white man's paradigm and the white man's definitions, fine. But even then, it does not hold true. So what I do? That's one thing. Black people are flirting with the right wing, genocidal right wing, because of immigration. Because we have a warped sense of, of economics. We have a warped sense of employment. We have a warped sense of entitlement and worthiness. Another thing is the gun laws. For a long time, black people have been denied an opportunity to buy guns, to defend ourselves. And so white people are like, I support guns, guns, guns. And so you got a lot of black men who love this black hard steel phallic symbol called a gun. And they really think if we can get guns, white men got guns, and whatever the white man got is worth having. Whatever the white man don't value must not have value. And you'd be surprised if you just take a step back and look beyond the rhetoric and how much even the most militant, anti-white, white devil, whitey hater, whitey killer, Black people, they just want to be white. I'm glad Yvette came out of the ADOS and said, I, we need to be made white. She's saying what a lot of y'all feeling. Umar wants to be a white man. Just listen to him. For, and you, I know once you sift through all the Marcus Garvey, uh, 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 Frederick Douglass, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and once you sift through all, he is nothing more than a white right wing ultra conservative. These dudes want to be white. They want to smoke cigars sitting in a big chair at the head of a conference room table and run the world according to their own warped sense of ownership and entitlement. They don't want true liberation. They don't want justice. They just want control. How do I know? Look at Africa under neocolonial rule. When all these black men ascended to the, the, the uh, seat of prime minister or absolute dictator. And how did they behave? Just like white men. The same Africans that just fought to get off the plantation, fought the British, fought the French, fought the Germans to get off of the plantation. They found that African soldiers showed up and said, get your ass back on the plantation. And they saw the same trucks with the same corporate logos pull into the mines and extract the resources and drive off under an African ruler that drove up under a European colonial ruler. So we have to be real careful because we love that black rhetoric. And we really think these cats like these alpha black men with the guns are going to liberate us from white men. <laughs> When they most likely, when they get into positions of power, they facilitate white men's exploitation. They become the middleman or the conduit of our exploitation, not the enders of our exploitation, including Mugabe. But he's got real strong rhetoric. So that's another thing where black people are being seduced by the right wing. You're going to get rid of the immigrants and you're going to and then uh, you're going to get rid of the immigrants and you're going to uh, allow us to have guns, because we're going to have guns, too, to fight the government. Even though you keep finding when a black man lawfully holding a gun is killed by the cops, where's the NRA? White people are not, the white right wing is not trying to fight to preserve your gun laws. And even if you go back and study the truth, stop listening to the rhetoric of the right wing talking about Oh, Hitler took away the guns. Hitler did not take away the guns. Hitler was pro-arming the citizens. He not only wanted the citizens of Germany to have guns, he wanted the 
citizens of Germany, starting at the age of 12 to 14, to be trained with the gun. Hitler was a pro-armed citizen. And as strongly as he was pro-German gun rights, he was anti-Jew gun rights, not anti-gun rights. And just like America is pro-gun rights, but anti-black gun rights. But black people start to flirt with the right wing. Another thing is this family values nonsense. A lot of black people are starting to move towards the right on family values. I support the family. And we want our women to be submissive and get back in the kitchen and get out. Because women, if a Mexican ain't stole my job, a woman done stole my job. And we want, and we keep spitting these stupid, unenlightened statistics about 70% of black people were in marriage. 70% of black children were in two-parent household. Yeah, on paper. Let me tell you something about the 50s and the 40s. Go talk to your actual grandma. Quit looking at these white statistics and go talk to your grandma. And you'll find that, yeah, we were married. Yeah, on paper. Yeah, statistically we were married. But your grandpa was up north working in the Ford factory while I was down in Mississippi. You know, the family was in, yeah, the marriage statistics look wonderful. But the marriage reality, the reality of poor black families was something totally different. Real talk, my grandmother was married her entire life. She was recently widowed. Probably, no, she was, it wasn't recent. More like 12 years ago. My grandfather died. But they were married for like almost 50 years, 48, 47 years. They lived together maybe three years. And she told him, get the hell out of here. I'll take these six kids and raise them my damn self because I'm not sure why. I, I, I mean, she don't tell me, you know, my grandmother's old school. She don't tell her business. But out of a 50 million year marriage, they maybe lived together maybe five years total out of those almost 50 years of marriage. So those are the statistics. He got out the house and left her in the house. But they stayed married the whole time, their whole life. So on paper, that was a two-parent household. And a lot of those things broke down like that, where the men and women didn't live together, where there were, you know, it, it wasn't no damn leave it to beaver. But the, the Republicans promised to give us family values. And how are they going to give us family values? By defunding welfare and support to families, defunding housing programs, by defunding uh, child care, early childhood education, by defunding food stamps, by taking away resources from poor families and giving it to rich families. And somehow having fewer resources and fewer uh, support and a weaker social safety net will somehow, but they're going to put prayer in schools and they're going to take away abortion and they're going to take away uh, uh, contraception. And that will somehow magically strengthen family values. When the number one threat to the family, no matter how your family is formulated, is capitalism. Hyper exploitation of the working classes and divestment from social programs and social infrastructure, that is how the number one threat to the family. But again, black people, we're all Christians. Vast majority of us are Christians, and a few of us that extract, that run from Christianity fall into Islam or some other uh, spookism that, that has a strong family, traditional family values. So they're going to stop the abortion of black babies and promote the marriage of black men and women who can't stand each other cohabitating for the rest of their lives. So there's a lot of things because we are ideologically regressive. We do not think critically or critically analyze these movements. So many black people are starting to flirt. Now, there was a time when there was not so much ideological confusion and thus regression within black people because there were fewer illusions in the society. Even if you are a black person who was educated, even if you are a black person of means, there were few illusions for you. You understood that your blackness was your be-all, end-all. 
Sammy Davis Jr. was one of the time the most recognized and celebrated black entertainers in all of America. And Sammy Davis Jr. literally traveled from state to state, from sea to signing sea, to perform for white folks. And when he came to perform for white folks, he couldn't eat at the white folks restaurants that he was performing at. He couldn't come and get a seat in the theaters that he sold out. He had to come in through the colored entrance. So when Sammy Davis Jr., when Nat King Cole, when the big bands, you know, they had these big uh, ensemble bands, Count Basie, when they would come to town, they would tour throughout the South and the North. The North, the only if you south of the Canadian border, you in the South, to quote Mal uh, Malcolm X. Don't try to think that in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, that the North was somehow an escape. There was no escape to the North. It was just a different form or a different quality of, of, of white racism. So the black Sammy Davis Jr. would have to go to the black hotel, eat at the black restaurant, and a lot of times they do the black venues. Dick Gregory was doing that up to the day he died. I got to see Dick Gregory speak and perform on a number of occasions. And most 90% of the time, I never paid a dime. Because the white people would pay Dick Gregory to come to, to, to give a talk, to give a performance, to sit on a panel, they pay his airfare, they pay his lodging, they pay everything. And when Dick Gregory showed up in town, he'd find a black church, a black school auditorium, some black person's living room, and go and give a free performance on the white folks' tickets to black folks. And then Dick Gregory would say, stop telling the white folks I'm doing this. They getting hip. White folks are like, we just paid Dick Gregory, we paid his airfare, we paid for, for, for his lodgings, we gave him $50,000. We gave him a plaque and a ribbon. And then he's down on, uh, in the hood on, on, on uh, 31st and Prospect in some musty uh, storefront church giving a better performance than he gave at the uh, concert hall. That's how Dick Gregory would do. So I saw Dick Gregory from Harlem, New York to, 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 to downtown Kansas City, never paid a dime. And he came there and talked or gave a performance. Dell Jones used to do the same thing. Dell Jones would go to IBM and give a lecture. He'd pay and go out and do book signings and white folks would pay and then he would go around to the small black venues for free. Because he's like, I'm in town. These white people pay for me to come in town. So since I got the white folks money, I'm going to go here and do this for my people. That's how it used to be in some black people, that, how it used to be back during the era of segregation. But after desegregation, a lot of these artists were like Beyonce, told the black people, bow down, bitches. You want to see me? You got to come to the concert hall. You got to pay the big money. Now that it's desegregated. So black people got cut out. A lot of the big bands, a lot of the major performers, black people no longer got to see it. Because it used to be Sammy Davis Jr. would come and perform at Carnegie Hall, then he'd go to... Uh, Harlem or some other small venue in the community and put on the show because that's where he knew he had to be in good standing. No matter how rich you got as a black person, no matter how much fame you got as a black person, you knew you had to be in good standing with the community. Because if you weren't in good standing with the community, when you went to Alabama to perform, when you went to the Grand Ole Opry, or when you went around the country and performed, if the black community shunned you, you'd literally have to sleep in the back seat of your van. You wouldn't get no good meals. Because you've got to go to white people to feed you. They're going to spit in your food, put feces in your food. They always, even the black entertainers. There was this one black, uh, uh, blind, there was some black blind, uh, I, his name escapes me. But he was blind and he was recording. He used to be a street performer. Uh, Professor William Mackey recounted this story. He was a bluesologist. And there was this old blind black man that would play, play the fiddle and sing blues, and people would put money in his cup because he, he could, um, that was before the FDR New Deal, before the Americans with Disabilities Act. These policies that y'all, these leftist liberal policies that y'all are now losing, that the Republicans are eroding, and y'all so slick because y'all so anti-liberal, y'all letting get snatched away from you. But anyway, they heard this man sing and had the best voice, so they went and got him and brought him in a record studio to have him record an album. This man, they said this this blind, uh, I can't, I, I, uh, let me see if I can find his name. Oh, 
Oh, here it is. Uh, Statesboro Blues. Blind Willie McTell. That's him. Blind Willie McTell. He was on the streets. And anyway, they brought him into a record studio to, to play the to, to record him because they knew they white folks gonna make all this money, give him a contract he couldn't read. But they said while he was performing, he was very thirsty. And uh he was sweating. Because this is the, the, the South, no air conditioning, no uh, you know, facilities. So he asked the, the secretary in the in the studio the woman who runs errands in the studio, to say, can I have some water and can I have a cloth to uh, wipe the sweat? And they said the woman, because she resented having to run errands for this black man, went and got toilet water, dipped water from the toilet tank. And then she went and got this rag that they used to kill flies on the window. They kept it on the windowsill to swat flies and to wipe flies away. So she gave him the water and gave him the rag. And he had to wipe the rag with this filthy rag with, with dead fly carcasses on it. And you know when you smash a flag, the maggots, sometimes they have maggots. And then he drank the, the toilet tank water. But he was blind. He didn't know. And all of the producers and all of the, the, the record execs, they all stood around and thought that was the funniest thing. And I mean, uh, I remember uh, Professor Mackey telling that. And he almost broke down in tears in, in a lecture. Lecture hall full of people. Because he really felt that. I mean, he, he's, a good, he's a Gullah Geechee man. He knows. He's seen some, some of the horrors of the, of the South in that era, in the segregation era. So black people knew if you ran afoul of the black community, no matter how rich you were, no matter how much white folks love to dance to your music or watch you perform, if you were left at the mercy of the whites and didn't have the, the support and embraced by the black community, you were vulnerable. But that all changed with desegregation. Now the black performers could not only go to any town and, and they, could, they didn't have to stay with black folks in the black boarding house or the black hotels or eat at the black restaurant and depend on the black uh, 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 deacons and stuff to move them around town and protect them and make sure that, that, that the white man that hired you to come perform paid up. You didn't have to get no black union muscle. My wife's father was union muscle. He used to, when, when black civil rights and black people would come to town, when Dr. King come to town, he would be the big muscle. He big six foot five, 300 pound. You know, he was one of them, you had to go. But now you could, black entertainers come to town with full police escort. These wealthy blacks come to town. They stay at the Hilton. They stay at the Ritz Carlton. So they didn't need us anymore. So that level of cohesion, that level of interdependence got eroded. And when you had that level of cohesion and you know, you, your thought, you might have your own ideas, but they couldn't stray too far from reality. Because if you got to thinking, I'm only human, it's just about the money, the color, black and white don't matter, it's all about green, then you get a billy club in your forehead. You're drinking toilet water in a white record studio when, you're, when your thought and your ideas stray too far from the core. But now in the time of segregation, desegregation, now the time of integration, now the time of, 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 of um, neoliberal capitalism, the black elites, the Meek Mills, the Jay-Zs, the Carter family, the Oprah Winfrey's, the Michael Jacksons, not only do I not have to be black, I don't even have to look black anymore. They don't feel that they don't depend on us. And they say all the time, all over social media, I don't owe you nothing. I asked the universe for my success. I put out because I was positive and hardworking. And I know positive, hardworking, poor people everywhere. They really think I did this myself. It wasn't Fred Hampton. It wasn't Dr. King. It wasn't Marcus Garvey. It wasn't Carlos Cooks. It wasn't Ida B. Wells. It's just me. And if I was born on a plantation, then I'd work really hard and be really smart and be really dedicated. I'd have got off the plantation myself. So that is one of the roots. The fact that we were not just liberated. There's a difference between being separated and being liberated. We were atomized. We were individualized. So we didn't make proper use of the concessions. 
And so now you have black people with all these divergent, silly ideologies, and most of their ideologies are not grounded in the historical, contextual, political, cultural reality of African people. You got black people who run around saying we are the Native Americans. You have black people who say we are not, we are transcended Africa. We're no longer tied to Africa. And in fact, Africa's are our, our opposition and competitors. You got black people who think that, hey, I got a white spouse. And, you know, there was a time where if I walked down the street with my spouse, I would be lynched. But now I can walk and I'm celebrated. You got black people say, hey, I'm, I'm LGBTQAI, which transcended. You got all these divergent positions. And the core reality of that black people are not only oppressed, but we are encapsulated and surrounded by a hostile government, a hostile culture, hostile media apparatus. And the fact that they go and get a small, less than 1% of us and put them on podium and we get to watch black people chase balls for millions of dollars or perform and degrading music, dehumanizing music for millions of dollars, that black CEOs and a black president and a black uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we really are confused about our state. And we get people running around talking about oppression is a state of mind, slave mentality, victim mentality. Even though we know that the government and private sector has done direct harm and continues to do direct harm to our community for purposes of suppression and purposes of exploitation and extraction of our wealth, talent, and resources. So, but because we are able to think thoughts that are inconsistent with reality, we start to take actions that are contrary to our interests. So we have secured individual freedom in the post-civil rights era, but we did not use our individual freedom for collective liberation. The whole point of giving black people the individual right to go to Harvard, giving black people an individual right to pursue their dreams, giving black people the individual right to be able to sit where they want to sit in the public accommodations, to buy homes in whatever community they want to buy, and to achieve whatever uh, uh, achievements their talent and perseverance allows them to achieve. The whole point of that was so that we could reconsolidate after you go out and pursue your individual dreams, you reconsolidate for collective empowerment and collective liberation. We just stuck on the individual part again. And every time this time of year, it's May, it's prom season, it's graduation time, and we keep posting all these goddamn images. A black boy goes off to Harvard with a 5.0 GPA. A young black girl graduates high school at 12 years old. She's off to MIT. And I've yet to see the article, follow-up article, four, five, six, ten years later and say black MIT graduate goes to Africa and sets up a missile defense system. Black Harvard graduate goes to Africa and sets up a communal compound for, for self-sufficiency, a self-sustaining, green, ecological, renewable community. Because that's not what they're doing. They're going to work for Microsoft. AT&T, Boeing, to use their talents against us. So their individual freedom becomes a collective liability to us because we don't have the right ideology. And white people for a long time thought if we give white people during the civil rights movement and black people say we want education, we want fair housing, we want opportunities, we want uh, 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 concessions and set-asides, affirmative action, give me, give me, give me. White people said we got more than enough money. America's so rich, we could give black people everything we owe them and a little cherry on top, and it wouldn't really affect our operations. In fact, if we unleashed black people with their talent, number one, they are talented, but also black people are very loyal to America. They wrote this down. They said if a black, they wrote and understood that if there was a black militant uprising, the vast majority of black people would not support this out of loyalty to the state. Just like when them brothers took up them guns and started targeting police, the black community was like, whoa, I don't, by and large, black people did not support police kill us, but we ain't supposed to kill the police. That ain't how the game goes. But white people actually thought if we give white people, black people, freedom, they will seek vengeance because that's what we would do. White people were projecting their own behaviors on us. 
And they thought, as soon as we get a black billionaires, and we get black media moguls, and we get black professors, and we get black people openly serving in open combat and train them how to fight and use our weapon system, as soon as we let black people into the stock market and understand our economic system, they're going to get vengeance on us. And they're going to run to Africa. They're going to run to South America and unite with other blacks and use it against us. That was one of the main reasons. Yeah, it's because racists are evil, but racists are also very insecure. They had no idea that we would use all this opportunity, take all these resources and feed it right back into the system that was oppressing us. They really thought we would try to, because that's what the Chinese did. The Chinese would like come to our country, set up factories. And the Chinese stole every bit of technology and set up their own economy. And now they're the second largest economy and the fourth largest military. And within a generation, they're going to be able to come to America and be like, sit your ass down. We run things. Things don't run we. That's what they thought black people were going to do, too. That's what they thought we were going to do. But we didn't. And we haven't done it. And now we go from being Democrat was bad. Blacks being Democrats is, 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 is not good. But instead of moving further, the problem with the Democrats is not that they're left and liberal, that they're not left and liberal enough. So if you leave the Democratic Party, you should go further to the left. You should become a radical, not a liberal, but a radical, not a progressive, but a revolutionary. But now we're regressing towards conservatism. Because we are confused about where we're supposed to be politically and we're confused because we've been atomized. We've been scattered to the winds because of this individual opportunity. We thought confused individual opportunity with collective liberation. And the few of us who are still aware of this, we're still being stupid. We still have a lot of old ideas. Too many of us conscious people, we're trying to reproduce what Garvey did, reproduce, trying to wait for another Malcolm to emerge. We need to rework our, our, our plan. You're not a revolutionary if you're not flexible, if you're not a critical thinker, if you're not able to do analysis on your feet and make the necessary adjustments to work towards the ultimate goal. Our goal is not to re resurrect the Panther Party, new Black Panther Party. Our goal is not to wait for or try to mimic Malcolm X. We do not honor our ancestors by mimicking them or repeating their mistakes. We have to build on their foundation, not replicate the foundation. You can't have a building that's all foundation. There's other elements. So we got to advance. We got to be more cunning. And it's a little harder for us because when you go to black people in the 50s, when Malcolm, when King, when Garvey came to our people and said, we're oppressed, they were like, yeah, we're oppressed. Tell us something we don't know. At least everybody. Some people say we need to integrate. Some people say we go back to Africa. Some people say we take up arms. There were all these different solutions, but the core problem was understood by every black person in the world. And the few black people that didn't understand the solution, oh, white people treat me right, those people were fringe. They were like, get out of here. Nobody considered. They, they didn't represent a relevant population. But today you walk into a room full of black people and say, we're oppressed. You'll hear a million different responses. Oh, you got slave mentality. Oh, you're keeping yourself down. Oh, white people. You hear all these different things. My husband white. My wife white. And you know, you hear all this different stuff. So we can't even agree on the core problem. So that's why we got all these divergent solutions that are even non-solutions. So we do need some ideological refinement in order to get political advancement. And when I talk politics, that's another thing. Y'all think, oh, Democrat, Republican. That's not what politics is. Politics is about controlling the apparatus of the states, controlling the institutions of society, control and distribution and, and refinement processes and redistribution of the resources. That's politics. There were politics going on long before there was a such thing as Democrat or Republican or even black people were engaged in politics before there was even a constitutional convention or even a such thing as a U.S. government. We've been doing governance and politics longer than any other people on this planet. So stop limiting your political scope and your political perspective to U.S. electoral politics. That's not what I'm talking about when I say black political regression. Anyway, if you... Bro, the Owl Show, please help the show to stay on the air if you appreciate this analysis. Monday, we're going to be talking about the specific dangers of capitalism. What is capitalism doing to you? Because we're hearing a lot about collect a bag, and now we got, uh, what's your, your boy, uh, 21 Savage, that's teaching black kids how to be good capitalists, how to succeed in capitalism. 
and the only way to, to, to the, the, the way for black people to be the ultimate failures is for us to succeed at mimicking our oppressors. Equality with your oppressor makes you equal to your oppressor. What, what more can I say? Anyway, Bro Diallo Show, Q4 Radio. If you value these insights, You know, I'm not like Yvette. I ain't on no panels. I ain't with none of these. I ain't like Umar. I don't ask you to pay me or support me based on what I'm going to do. I'm saying support what I am currently doing. <laughs> what there is evidence of what I'm doing. Go to become a Patreon supporter. Make a donation. Help to keep us on the air. Because when we're gone, we're gone. And we won't come back. And our position is not secure. Every month. Hell, every week uh, we have to make decisions and, and move things around in order to stay on the air. So I need your support in order to continue. I'm willing to fight, but I need support to fight with me. Q4 Radio, Bro Diallo Show, AM6080, DialloKenyatta.com. You can get information on how to support. You'll get archives, back shows, and all of that. And I will be here Monday morning. We're going to talk about the specific harm that capitalism, parasitic capitalism, is causing to you and yours. It ain't just some ideology. It ain't just some book, some, some manifesto somewhere. Capitalism is having day-to-day -day negative impacts on us. And some solutions, the way to defend ourselves and ultimately end this exploitation. Let's go out. We came in with Shayon Kuti. Let's go out with Shayon Kuti. It is Kuti Legacy, Fela Legacy Friday, Bro Diallo Show. Oh, also, you can come to, to, to cultivate some soil this, this weekend. Uh, and, and go to Ecologic Outreach. I'll post the, uh, the, the guard if you want to come out and plant some food, cultivate some soil, and, and grow your own food over this summer. Come on out to the HF Garden. Brody Allo Show, Q4 Radio.